Hi, I'm Bekmi Berserker and welcome to the sixth episode of my Let's Roll series, which focuses on the generation and progression of each Bekmi Dungeons & Dragons character class. In this episode we'll be focusing on the Elf. If you don't know what Bekmi is, I strongly recommend you watch my Bekmi playlist, where I dive into many aspects of the game and make the case for why I think it's the greatest version of the Dungeons & Dragons game. Before I continue with exploring the generation of a Bekmi Elf, I also recommend those unfamiliar with Bekmi to watch the previous episodes in this series, especially the Fighter and the Magic user videos, as some of the mechanics mentioned here are explained in more depth in those videos, specifically the Fighter Combat options which an Elf has access to. Also I just wanted to acknowledge that there will be quite a bit of repetition in this video regarding Demi-Humans, as many of the mechanics have already been raised in the video on the Dwarf. Hopefully you can forgive me. As I roll up an elf, I will explore the character class as presented in the Rules Cyclopedia, released in 1991. Once generated, we'll go up the levels to examine how the class has progressed and what's changed. As I'm using the Rules Cyclopedia, I will be including the Skills Rules and the Weapon Mastery Rules. Today we're going to be looking at generating the sixth character class we come across in the Rules, and that is the Elf. The Elf is one of three demi-human classes available to play in the core Beckme Dungeons and Dragons rules. We are told that demi-humans are referred to as such because they are similar to humans. In addition, we are told that demi-human characters are less common than human ones, due to them being reclusive and mysterious, so a vastly different take on playing a non-human than in later editions of the game. If you follow the rules as written, being able to play a demi-human could be quite difficult. Because one must roll 3d6 for each ability score in order, combining this with the fact that demi-humans have a minimum requirement for certain ability scores, then you could only play a demi-human if you satisfy this requirement. Of course, this was heavily house-ruled, even back in Beckme's heyday, because people wanted to be able to choose what they wanted to play. This had the effect of making demi-humans less mysterious and more common as adventurers, but many people have house-ruled this to build the kind of fantasy world they want. That's the beauty of D&D. What I need to state before moving on is that playing a demi-human in Beckme uses the race as class system, meaning that if you play an elf, then that is your class. You cannot be an elf thief or an elf cleric, you may only be an elf. This mechanic has come in for a lot of criticism, and is one of the key reasons that this edition of D&D has suffered from the moniker of Basic, when advanced Dungeons and Dragons had less limitations in this regard. But the best defence of races class as a system that I've come across is that demi-humans are pretty much alien to human. They do not conceive things in the same way that humans do, they do not share the same world view. So whilst such a lack of diversity of options might seem restrictive to humans, to demi-humans, us humans are just plain weird. That said, as Beckme developed, options to expand beyond the rules as written, to offer demi-humans some variety, were also developed. The most notable of these are within the Gazetteer series, and there's a great option to become an elf lord, or an elf wizard, in the Gazetteer centering on that race, which I've done a review on, link on the screen and in the description. Right, let's get back to rolling an elf. We are told that an elf is slender and graceful, at around 5 to 5.5 feet tall. We're also told that they have pointy ears. That's important, I guess. In addition, they can live to 800 years old. According to the rules, there are very few elven adventurers, which fits with the description of demi-humans in general. Elves prefer to feast and frolic rather than delve into dungeons for treasure. I'll let your imagination decide what frolic means. Elves have access to the same special fighting options as first level fighters do, such as setting a spear to receive a charge or using a lance from horseback, both of which have the potential to do double damage. However, elves only gain more combat options from after 10th level as opposed to 9th level for fighters once they achieve an attack rank of D. I'll elaborate more on attack ranks in a moment. Elves can cast magical spells and are fascinated by magic in a similar way as a magic user, but they are unable to achieve the same level of power. In fact, if you wanted to look at an elf in a purely mechanical way, then they are basically a fighter magic user, but with a higher experience point requirement for levelling up, and with saving throws that improve dramatically over their 10 levels. Yes, elves may only achieve a maximum of 10th level, although they may rise up in what's called attack ranks beyond this, gaining some attack options and special abilities, but not gaining any more hit points or saving throw improvements. There are variant rules in the rules cyclopedia that allow for doing away with this maximum level rule, 
but for the purpose of this video, I'm sticking to the core rules. High level elves have the potential to become extremely resistant to breath weapons, automatically taking half damage from all breath weapons and only taking quarter damage on a successful save. Elven special abilities include Infravision, which is a way of seeing heat sources in the dark up to 60 feet, and Detection, which just allows elves to find secret or hidden doors better than anyone else, so a much more limited version of the Detection ability than dwarves have. In addition, elves have a natural immunity to the paralyzing attack of ghouls. Strangely, this immunity does not cross over into any other form of paralyzing attack, and I have to be honest, I'm not entirely certain of the literary source of elven immunity to ghoul paralysis. So if anyone out there does know, then please share your knowledge in the comments. Elves are organized socially into clans, and at the center of each clan is their elven relic, the Tree of Life, which has enormous spiritual significance to the clan. Well, that's the basics of an elf when starting at first level. So, let's roll. Here's the front half of my character sheet. Let's stick the important information about an elf on the right here, so that we can refer to it as needed. First, I need to ensure that my roles allow me to be an elf in the first place, so my character's intelligence score must be 9 or above. We are told that an elf has two prime requisites, strength and intelligence, so I would want to ensure those scores are my highest to maximize the amount of experience points my character earns. Right, let's put the dungeon master's name here and the class and level we're going to demonstrate. As we're looking at the elf today, we can assume that the scores I rolled favoured that class, like so. Admittedly, these are crazily good scores, and I went a bit mad with that charisma score, but it's just to demonstrate the benefit of a high charisma score later in the video. Okay, so now it's time to work out the adjustment for each ability score. Let's get that chart on the screen. Okay, so I get a plus two adjustment for my strength, and the adjustment for my intelligence is also plus two, Looking at my wisdom score, I get no bonus, but I get a plus one for my dexterity. Unfortunately, I also get no bonus for my constitution score, which means I had better roll well for my hit points, as I have no adjustment to add to the hit point rolls. As for charisma, I get a plus three adjustment here. My elf clearly has charm and wit. They can be the center of attention, but at the same time not in a bothersome way. They're just a really fascinating person to be around, although perhaps this elf can sometimes get carried away with the situation. Charisma in Beckme offers quite a bit more than what might be guessed on the surface. As we can see on the chart on the right, in addition to the plus three reaction adjustment this elf will gain when interacting with others, the next column, labeled max number of retainers, means this elf is charismatic enough to hire and lead seven retainers at a time. What's interesting to note in the rules cyclopedia is that elves choose to only hire other elves when requiring mercenaries, even though they don't mind hiring other races for other specialisms. A strange elven quirk, I guess. In addition, due to this high charisma, each of these seven retainers will have a morale score of 10, meaning they are less likely to run away when things are getting a bit delicate. Each of these adjustments will affect my character's interaction with the world, as described by the highlighted text. We won't get too much into these unless they specifically impact my elf's generation, but I will immediately change my elf's armor class as that dexterity score of 13 will reduce it, which is a good thing, from a natural armor class of 9 to 8. Right, so my elf is shaping up nicely, but how many hit points do they start with? Well, looking at the information in my table, an elf's hit dice is 1d6. Worse than a fighter, but better than a magic user. Going strictly by the beg me rules, a character may not get maximum hit points at first level, so I roll my 1d6 and get a 3. I get no constitution adjustment to this, so that's it, a measly three. This elf is going to be firing from range for a few levels. Let's insert this number into the hit point box here. The next thing I need to do is add my elf's saving throw scores to the sheet. In Begme, saving throw scores are determined by class, as shown on this table, so all we need to do is transfer the numbers for level one onto my sheet. So death ray or poison is 12, magic wands is 13, Paralysis or Turn to Stone is also 13, Dragon Breath is 15, and Rod's Staff or Spell is also 15. These saving throws are pretty much on par with the human classes, but we'll see how significantly these scores drop over the course of 10 levels. Let's now turn to languages. As mentioned in my previous Let's Roll videos, each character starts with at least some understanding of what's referred to as the common tongue. As you can see on this languages table, Due to my elf having an intelligence of 17, 
you might presume they have just four languages. The first two being common and my elf's alignment language, plus two more for their intelligence score. However, we are told that elves are able to speak a number of languages in addition to these. Specifically, there is the elf tongue, of course, and then Noll, Hobgoblin and Orc. The two additional languages I'll choose for my elf due to their high intelligence will be Goblin and Dragon. As for which alignment tongue they'll have, well, I'm going for Chaotic. My elf is not a bad person, but their elven personality has made them extremely whimsical. They have the best of intentions, but when you live to 800, things can always be left till tomorrow. They're really sorry they didn't back you up in the duel yesterday morning, but, well, they just didn't notice the passing of the day. Anyway, my elf is Chaotic Whimsical. Let's put all these languages on the sheet as well as my elf's alignment. And with that maximum charisma of 18, my elf could become a formidable diplomat, if they can remain focused for, not long enough, but narrow enough. That's probably the elven way of seeing it. Right, so my elf is almost there in terms of this front half of the sheet. The combat section at the bottom is the same for all starting character classes and just relates to the number needed to hit a particular armor class. My elf has a plus two strength adjustment to hit in melee combat and a plus one adjustment to hit in missile weapons. Let's amend this hit roll table to account for this. Of course, these numbers may be further impacted by magic or weapon mastery adjustments. But for now, let's give my elf a name. Let's use the one from the basic red box when introducing new players to this class and call this elf Bell Rain. Let's also choose my favorite elf pick ever from the red box and insert that. There you go, meet Bell Rain, an unpredictable elf who, with that high intelligence of hers and that long lifespan, sometimes just looks too far ahead when thinking strategically. While she has one eye on the future, she sometimes misses what's going on right in front of her. One day just blends into the next, you know? So let's call her Bell Rain the Distracted. Still, she's rocking that young Stevie Nicks vibe and has a way about her that has anyone and everyone forgiving her tardiness. Despite her wanderings into human lands, she does miss her elven home and promises herself that she will return one day. Maybe tomorrow. Okay, Bell Rain the Distracted is shaping up to be an interesting elf. Now it's time to turn over the sheet and insert some further details, specifically information regarding her elf abilities, skill choices and weapon mastery details. Let's first look at elf abilities. As I mentioned earlier, all elves gain access to fighter combat options and at first level this only includes the set spear versus charge and lance attack maneuvers. In order to avoid too much duplication in these videos, I won't repeat the detail of these maneuvers here but I do a deep dive into these in my Let's Roll a Fighter video, so check that out if you haven't already. As I mentioned earlier, elves have an ability to see in the dark, using something called infravision, and an elf has this to a range of 60 feet. Infravision only works in complete darkness, and is rendered useless in the presence of both normal and magical light. Infravision causes warm things to be seen as red, and cold things to be seen as blue. This can include recent footprints. That said, Infravision does allow a character to discern things that are the same temperature as the environment. Infravision does not allow for the reading of text though, a light source is needed for that. Also, a creature with Infravision would need to be within 10 feet of an individual for them to be recognisable, unless otherwise easily distinguishable, like a big hat or something. Infravision has its limitations if played correctly, and it's not a catch-all see-in-the-dark ability that may be employed in the presence of torch-wielding humans. Infravision is for exploring magical secrets in the deep, dark places of the earth, where carrying a torch might highlight you as a target by its defenders. Find the treasure's location and then plan, before going in with your light spells fired up. Just don't take too long with the planning. These pesky humans are always in such a hurry. In addition to Infravision, elves have the detection ability. What that means is that elves are able to detect secret or hidden doors, which I would rule not to be the same as sliding doors that dwarves can detect. To take advantage of this detection ability, an elf must succeed at getting one or two on a d6. This detection action is not automatic and a player must inform the dungeon master what they are trying to detect and where. They can't just say they're trying to detect if there's a secret door in the room. This means that the player must be engaging with the description of the environment and participating in the game. We'll come back to these abilities later, as Belrain gains more fighter combat options beyond 10th level. For now, let's move on to skills. Each character starts with a minimum 4 skills, plus a character's intelligence adjustment. 
Belle Rain's intelligence adjustment is plus two, so she starts with six. An extra slot is gained at fifth and ninth level, and then is dependent on how many experience points she has as she climbs beyond tenth level. We'll see how this plays out as Belle Rain develops. In the meantime, she chooses alternate magics, blind shooting, leadership, lip reading, quick draw, and riding horse. We'll record these on the sheet along with their relevant ability score values, which must be rolled equal to or under to succeed in a skill check. Okay, now it's time to jump into Weapon Mastery. Weapon Mastery acquisition is a little different for demi-humans compared to humans. We are told that demi-humans have a basic knowledge of all weapons from first level, meaning they are not treated as being unskilled in any weapon. This is due to their longer lifespans and wilderness-oriented lifestyles. However, demi-humans may attempt to gain weapon mastery of any weapon they have a basic knowledge of, and for an elf this would be at 4th and 8th levels, as shown in this table. In addition, elves can continue to accumulate weapon mastery knowledge beyond their maximum level of 10 by getting one more attempt for every 200,000 experience points. As she is only first level, and to keep things simple, I will only enter the weapons Belle Rain is carrying, rather than listing every weapon she has a basic mastery of. Belle Rain is carrying a normal sword, dagger and longbow, so we'll record these in the weapon mastery section here, along with the stats associated with just having a basic skill. We'll see how access to more weapon mastery improves Belle Rain's effectiveness later in the video. As mentioned earlier, an elf is able to cast magical spells just like a magic user. This is why elves are seen as quite powerful, able to cast spells whilst being effective in physical combat and able to wear armour. Due to an elf's desire for magic, access to spells and magical items can be their main driver for adventure, so that they may obtain lost magical scrolls or even the spell books of fallen spellcasters. The rules state that first level elves begin with two first level spells recorded in their spell books. These spells are usually determined by the Dungeon Master, but this can vary from campaign to campaign. In Beckme and most old school Dungeons & Dragons games, elves can memorise a number of spells from what they have available, that is, from the spells that they know. The number of spells that can be memorised is dependent on the elf's level. Furthermore, once a spell is cast, it is erased from the memory of the elf, meaning it cannot be cast again that day, rendering an elf less effective until they are able to re-memorise their spells, which is typically done after they have been well rested, such as a night's sleep. When an elf learns their spells, they may use their memorization slots to memorize a spell multiple times, meaning that they may cast the same spell more than once, but of course this comes at the expense of not having slots available for other spells they may have in their spell book. In addition, if an elf wishes to use the reversed version of a spell, such as slow instead of haste, they must have memorized the reversed version of the spell, they may not attempt to cast slow if they have only memorized haste. This is different from clerics, who may reverse spells in the moment, as needed. Critically, the most powerful spells an elf can cast are 5th level, but as I mentioned earlier, there are supplements like the Gazetteer series and variant rules within the rules cyclopedia that may allow you to change this if you wish. Checking this elf progression table, we can see that Belrain, who is only 1st level, can memorize just one spell a day of the two available in her spellbook. As she progresses up the levels, this number will increase. For instance, at 6th level, she will be able to memorize 6 spells a day, consisting of 2 1st, 2nd and 3rd level spells. Obviously, Belrain will want to be obtaining as many spells as she can as she levels, so finding scrolls and spellbooks whilst adventuring is a priority, in order to have a comprehensive portfolio of options. So Belrain is only beginning at level 1. Let's give her two first level spells for her spellbook. These can be Magic Missile for when needing to attack from range, and Read Magic for when the deciphering of magical writings is required. Now let's put a nice table here to refer to so that we can track how many spells Belle Rain can memorize. Now I'll tick Magic Missile as being her single memorized spell. It's not worth choosing Read Magic right now, as it's a much more scholarly spell, unlikely to be required in the heat of battle. So that's spells for now. We'll come back to them as Belrain levels up. I'm not going to delve into equipping my character or determining their wealth, as it won't really add to the information I'm trying to relay here. So this is Belrain the Distracted, our first level elf. It's been over a hundred years since Belrain left the safety of Alfheim to live amongst the Kalari in the Grand Duchy of Karamekos. She adapted to human ways just a bit too much and took up with a group of adventurers investigating a rise in goblin activity within the Dimrak Forest. Since then, Belrain has grown in power and self-belief, although sometimes she can't see the wood for the trees. 
Her elven mind often sees far beyond the requirements of the moment, and she has been more than a little dependent on her fine companions to help her navigate the nuances of daily life in a human town. But now Belrain has 3,100,000 experience points and is 10th level, with an attack rank of M. She's left the lands of men and elves behind, and stands atop the highest peak of the Worm's Tooth range. The raging wind tugs at her golden hair, before it suddenly changes direction and almost knocks her off her feet. Materializing before her in a bubble of ecstasy is a celestial of the sphere of time. It reaches out with what looks like a hand, but before Belrain takes it to accept the gift of immortality, her elven life flashes before her eyes. She was never built for the small horizons of this world, her fate was to see into the next, and cast her vision beyond into limitless dimensions. Before Belrain makes physical contact with the Celestial and gets whisked away to only the immortals knows where, let's have a look at Belrain's character sheet to see how she's changed. First, let's look at her saving throws. As Belrain is now 10th level, we can refer to the correct numbers on this table and copy them to the sheet, like so. One thing to remember here is that Elves' saving throws do not improve past 10th level. That said, the rate of improvement from 1st to 10th level here has been incredible, demonstrating that if you're willing to suffer having to gain more experience points to level up, then it will be worth it. Okay, so let's now move on to the hit roll chart. We'll consult the numbers appropriate to Belrain's level and update them on this sheet. What you must understand is that demi-humans use the fighter attack rolls up to their maximum level. The DH column here referring to demi-humans is their progression beyond maximum level and into their attack ranks. Belrain is 10th level with an attack rank of M, so her Thaco becomes the equivalent of a 25th level fighter and drops to 2 for both melee and missile combat when taking her ability adjustments into consideration. Also, you will notice that there is a dagger symbol next to some of these numbers. This just means that this amount is added to the damage of an attack if a natural 1 is not rolled. Let's transfer these numbers onto the character sheet like so. It's also worth mentioning though, it took Belrain 500,000 experience points more to achieve attack rank M than it would a dwarf, so she is powerful but her weight has been longer. The last thing we need to update on this part of the character sheet is Belrain's hit points by consulting the elf's hit dice information again. As you can see, Belrain gets 1d6 hit points per level, up to 9th level, and she may apply her constitution adjustment to this total. Well, Belrain never had a constitution adjustment, so that part is easy. At 10th level, she only receives an extra 1 hit point. I roll 8d6 for Belrain, getting a total of 33. Adding the 1 hit point for 10th level makes this 34, and adding this to Belrain's current 3 hit points makes a grand total of 37 hit points at 10th level. Not great. What's key to remember here is an elf cannot gain any more levels past 10th, so this total of 37 hit points is it for Belrain. She could not gain any more, barring some very powerful magic or a wish spell that might adjust her constitution score. So again we're confronted with a matter of balance. For all the abilities an elf might have, they cannot match a human when it comes to hit points at high level. Belrain now has 37 hit points, she has been the living embodiment of a glass cannon. Now let's turn the character sheet over again and update the items there. Let's first focus on Belrain's fighter combat options. At 10th level, attack rank D, Belrain gained four more fighter combat options. These are Disarm, Parry, Smash and Multiple Attacks, which we'll record here. I won't go into the detail of these fighter combat options in this video, as I already go into them in some depth in my Let's Roll a Fighter video. I'm going to again recommend that you check that out if you haven't already. When it comes to multiple attacks, an elf may only have a maximum of three attacks per round, as opposed to a maximum of 4 attacks per round that a fighter can have. Belrain gained a third attack per round when she obtained attack rank K. In addition to these fighter combat options, at attack rank G, Belrain's elven resistance to breath weapons improved to mean she now only receives half damage from them, or quarter damage on a successful save. We'll make a note of that under her elf abilities and move on to skills. Belrain gains another skill for levels 5 and 9, another at 1,350,000 experience points, and another at 2,350,000 experience points, due to gaining a further 1 million experience points. With Belrain's current XP total at attack rank M being 3,100,000 experience points, she would have gained another skill slot after obtaining a further 250,000 experience points, if she had stayed in the mortal world. But for now, we have 4 more skill slots to add to Belrain's character sheet. I'm going to choose Caving, 
ceremony, planar geography and tracking. If you have been watching my previous videos, you will see clearly that demi-humans do not obtain skills at the same level as humans, which in my opinion, demonstrates human versatility and dominance. I mean, Belrain has just 10 skill slots with 3,100,000 experience points. A fighter of the same intelligence would have 13, and a thief would have 14. Let's move on to weapon mastery. So according to this table, Belrain has two weapon mastery attempts by the time she reached 10th level, which required 600,000 experience points, and she gained an extra level of mastery for every 200,000 experience points after that up to her current 3,100,000 experience points, which is another 12 attempts, meaning a total of 14 weapon mastery attempts we need to account for. Belrain has three weapons here, which for simplicity's sake, I'll say remain her favourite. So I'll say she's successful at using 12 of these attempts when becoming a Grandmaster of the Normal Sword, Dagger and Longbow. Let's insert those details now. However, we also have two further attempts left over, so let's spend them on becoming an expert in the staff. She's picked up a few magical ones on her way to immortality. For more information on what all these numbers mean, then I go into Weapon Mastery in more detail in my video on the Master Rules, link on the screen and in the description. What's worth mentioning here though is how demi-humans benefit from the Weapon Mastery rules, given that they do not have to spend a slot on learning basic mastery. In effect, achieving Grand Mastery takes up only 4 attempts, when it takes a human 5. Finally, let's look at Belrain's spellbook. We can see that her spellcasting ability is maxed out at 10th level, but she knows every spell there is to know up to the spell level of 5th. She can also memorise a total of 14 spells, although only 2 of these are 5th level. This is far below the power of a magic user, but is balanced by an elf's combat abilities. And don't forget, an elf is also able to use magical wands, staves and scrolls. So with those final updates, there you have it. Belrain the Distracted, a 10th level attack rank M horizon scanning elf, who is about to step into immortality. Safe travels Belrain. Well, that's been the second episode of Let's Roll looking at a demi-human class and I'm well aware of the amount of repetition there was in it. Hopefully you didn't find it too arduous. Also, I strongly recommend watching the episodes on the fighter and the magic user for more information regarding combat options, weapon mastery and magical item creation. That said, generating this elf was quite thought provoking, especially considering how few hit points she ended up with. An elf might be a good warrior, but they also need to balance melee with magic, or they're going to need a benevolent cleric pretty soon. What's been your experience of the Beckney elf? Did the XP requirement put you off? Or did you want to play one straight away when you learned you could use a sword and a sleep spell? It would be great to know. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this sixth episode of Let's Roll. Please give it a like if you did indeed like it, and please hit the subscribe button if I've earned your future attention. If you'd like to thank me further, you can buy me a coffee, link on the screen or in the description. Otherwise, I'm Beckme Berserker. Keep making your saving throws, and I hope to see you back here soon.